Hey friends, we are on the road to redemption, message number four. You might remember from last week that we were with Jesus in his hometown synagogue and he was revealing his identity and his purpose to his hometown people and they didn't receive it well. I want to start there uh, in Isaiah 61. Uh, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the regaining of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he set up his mission, and this is the direction that he was going from the very beginning all the way through. But the question began to be, and it is for us at this moment as we are on this road, how will Jesus continue on this mission? Uh, will he live on earth forever? What is his plan? Well, we come then to Luke 5, and we find Jesus um, pursuing some men that he is going to have be his followers or his disciples. And so we're going to launch into Luke 5, and I'm going to read this passage and to talk about uh, some, some points and some ideas. Luke 5, 1 to 11. Now Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing around him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But at your word, I will lower the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets started to tear. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they were about to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For Peter and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's business partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. So when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. I want to talk about this idea from this passage, the idea that Jesus pursues followers on the road to redemption. Jesus pursues followers on this road. We're going to talk about it in, in three ways from this story. Number one, Jesus displays persistence. Uh, secondly, he displays power. And thirdly, he displays a picture, a beautiful picture. You know, almost every leader at every level of culture and society has tried to bring about change by the external control of people and people groups. And each time their efforts have failed. There's only one way to bring about lasting life change to whole people groups and individuals as well. Change that starts in the heart and is transferred from heart to heart. That is discipleship. Entrusting the truth to faithful men who will also teach others. And the process goes on and on and on. In this process that Jesus, he didn't, he didn't initiate it, but he used it to its maximum potential as a teacher, as a rabbi. Uh, he pursues followers on the road to redemption. And first of all, we'll talk about the idea that Jesus displayed persistence as he pursued these men. Uh, uh, and... Part of that is he was, he was just patient. He was patient. He's the most patient teacher I know, right? Peter and Jesus' um, first encounter was the day after his baptism. Uh, in John 142, we read this. Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Uh, so this was, um, this was like Dwayne the Rock Johnson's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, right? Simon the Rock Johnson? Just kidding. All right. Uh, Peter and Jesus' second encounter that we're aware of, uh, we find in Mark 1, 
Verse 16, as he went along the Sea of Galilee, he saw uh, Andrew, Simon, uh, Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will turn you into fishers of people. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in their boat, mending nets. Immediately he called them. Uh, Immediately they called, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So Jesus has invited them to follow him, and they were following him, but apparently they were following, following him part-time. It doesn't appear that they were following him 24-7 at this point. So Jesus is being patient and, and bringing them along, bringing them along, bringing them along. In this whole process. But he's also intentional. Jesus is very intentional as he pursues Simon, especially when we, and we're kind of focusing in on him and Simon. Jesus kind of enters into Simon's world, into Peter's world, uh, in a number of different ways. Number one, he shows up at Peter's lake, right? This is where Peter has been fishing for years. He shows up at where Peter fishes. He gets into Peter's boat, and then eventually he starts telling Peter where and when and how to fish, practically guaranteeing a catch. Jesus is persistent as he pursues followers on the road to redemption, but he's also, he's also displaying his power as well. Jesus displays his power with these men on this day, and especially we see it in Peter and Peter's response, of course. Jesus is already known to have been teaching with authority, but now he moves into Peter's area of expertise. <laughs> Listen carefully to Jesus' words. Put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Peter says, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your word I will lower the nets. Peter's words communicate doubt and duty, but he does obey. And in this moment, Jesus displays his power over nature. Uh, God commands fish into a net. <laughs> and we see that, and I'm sorry to say this to you fishermen, and I'm one of them, uh, that the time of day doesn't matter, the amount of self-effort doesn't matter, Experience doesn't matter. It's the hand of God. Jesus pursues followers on the road to redemption, uh, and he displays his persistence and his power. But then he, he paints a picture for Peter, a beautiful picture. He says, do not be afraid. Stop being afraid, is what he says to Peter and, and the other men. Stop being afraid of what? Of God's judgment? Of God's power? Of the loss of control of my life? Being afraid of my failure? Of, of the loss of my income? Of the cost of discipleship? What is Peter thinking in those moments? What is he so afraid of? I wonder if he's afraid of his own doubt in this context. His own self-doubt. But instead, Jesus gives Peter a picture of his grand potential. If he will follow the Master, there is amazing potential and an amazing future. I think this is what Peter and we are hungering for. Oh sure, a boat full or a multitude of fish is a great success, but what about the multitudes of men and women for the kingdom? The fish will be killed and eaten, and they will all be gone within a week. But to catch people alive, or to bring people to life, perhaps? To catch people alive, now that is significant. Bruce Wilkinson, in his Seven Laws of the Learner, says, God is calling you to be a visionary parent, a visionary teacher, a visionary boss. 
not just about the goals or objectives of your family or school or company, but about the people in those families, schools, and companies. He's calling you to get out of the daily grind and into the soaring clouds of potential. He tells the story in his book about the play, and it's also been made into a movie as well. It's called My Fair Lady. In the musical, a, a British speech professor, Henry Higgins, makes a bet with a friend that he can transform a poor cockney flower girl, Eliza Doolittle, into a refined blue blood, a true society lady. To assure his success, the professor not only works with the girl on her manners and speech and dress, he also spreads the word that he will escort a refined, beautiful princess to London's biggest ball of the year. He knew the power of expectations. Weeks later, when the door to Higgins' gilded carriage opens, a gasp goes up as the crowds see what they expect to see, a dainty, elegant princess. Throughout the evening, Eliza's speech and actions are profoundly shaped by the city's expectations of her. At one point, the professor asks the orchestra conductor about his opinion of the princess. The wizened old conductor, who has been to hundreds of balls all over Europe, opines that this young lady was clearly brought up in the most refined of all palaces. In the middle of the play, Eliza makes a profound statement. She says, the real issue isn't how she acts, but what people expect of her. And she says it was Professor Higgins' expectations that caused her to change the most. Jesus paints a beautiful picture for Peter in those moments. And Peter responds. Peter responds. We're going to look at Peter's response and then think about how we should respond as Jesus calls us. But when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Why Jesus' knees and not his feet? Well, remember, the boat is filled with fish. So try to imagine, imagine this scene for a moment. The, the, a boat filled to almost sinking with fish, and they're not just lying there, dead fish. They're flopping, and this, it's a, this chaotic scene, and there's activity everywhere. In the middle of this, Peter falls down into the fish at Jesus' knees, and he says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He finally sees himself as he really is, a sinner. His response is that Jesus should remove himself from such a sinner. Oh, I wish we could see that scene. The, the awesome power of that scene just, just strikes me. It fills me with, with joy and wonder, actually. But we should have this sort of fear that draws us to Jesus and prompts immediate obedience. Peter had the view of God that he must be distant from sin and sit in judgment of sinners. But Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. They left the boats, the nets, the fish, the vocation, the independence, and the doubt behind. This is not necessarily a call to full-time ministry, but it's definitely a call to follow Jesus with all that we are and all that we have. This is his call to everyone. Bob Deffenbaugh says, following Christ, finding him to be our all-sufficient Savior, requires that we forsake anything besides him in which we trust, in which we feel secure, in which we feel significant, in which we feel safe. An encounter with one individual can touch others around them as well. Because you see, it wasn't just Peter that was affected that day. Peter was the one who fell down on his face into the fish and he proclaimed these things to Jesus. But Jesus' call was to him and the others. And Peter, James, John, Andrew all followed Jesus. Apparently from that day, 24-7, they were with Jesus. What a powerful moment. 
But let's come back to Jesus' pursuit. His persistence of, of the disciples. We don't have time to talk about how Jesus chose the 12 out of hundreds. Uh, he didn't invest the same time and effort into every person. But I'm wondering, who are you pursuing? Are you pursuing someone to disciple? Who can be a follower of yours in that sense? Are you being prayerfully patient, asking God to lead you and guide you? Are you being intentional in your pursuit of another man that you can be a mentor to, brothers? Another woman that you can be a mentor to, sisters? And then Jesus' power. <laughs> I believe that Jesus still wants to display his power for his glory in the lives of those that he's calling to himself. Are we willing to obediently push out into the deep water? That's where the fish are, the deep water. To go where the fish are. Uh, perhaps in schools? Uh, in your workplace? In the bazaar? In the mall? In the cafe? The restaurant? Up on the mountain? God is working everywhere. Are we willing to let down the net? Perhaps invest the time and effort in hospitality? Find a way to lure people together? Pray for a great way to bait the hook and watch God work in the hearts and the minds of people. Ask, ask a good question. Say one thing. And here's the thing, people crave, all of us crave being a part of something bigger than ourselves, something significant. And so, yes, paint a desirable future for the Simon in your life. Another story from Bruce Wilkinson, Seven Laws of a Learner. Imagine that it's Teacher Appreciation Day at your church. You've had a challenging Sunday school class, and one student in particular, Brandon, has been hard to motivate. On Sunday morning, the class assembles, and after you've started the lesson, Brandon shows up late, carrying a small vase with some wilted flowers and a sample box of inexpensive candies. Come in, Brandon, you say. And what are you carrying? Uh, I brought these for you, he says sheepishly. Now, you could tell Brandon that he's late, and you know that he's disrupted your class. Besides, not only are the flowers wilted, you can't stand that brand of candy. <laughs> but you recognize that this is a special moment for him. You could give him a compliment and have him go sit down, but perhaps it's more important than that. Maybe it's worth delaying class for a blossoming moment. Brandon, you picked those flowers just for me? How beautiful. And you chose these candies for me? What a wonderful thing, a thoughtful thing to do. Do you know how this makes me feel? I feel wonderful. I think you've made me the happiest teacher in the whole wide world. Then you pause. He may beam with your praise, or he may squirm a little bit because he's not used to being praised like that. You know what? I believe you're going to grow up to be a very special person that every teacher is going to feel very lucky to have in her class. Then you pause again. Let him think about what, the, what that means. Then pat him on the shoulder or share a hug. This is a very special moment for Brandon. That's what blossoming someone looks like. Painting a beautiful future looks like. Not too difficult and ever so wonderful. But just think of all the good you could do in the lives of so many needy students and family members if you just changed your focus from the problems of the present to the dreams of the future. And as Jesus pursued followers on the road to redemption, he persistently, powerfully painted pictures for Peter and the others. And he continues to do it for us today. God bless you.